Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing Unit 8 in AP Bio by getting into Topic 8.5, Community Ecology. So the name of the unit is Ecology, right? Um, so really so far what we've talked about is population ecology and maybe we've gotten into organismal ecology earlier in this year, um, but now we're moving up a step further in the biosphere by discussing communities. All right, so we talked all about how populations grow and change and they can increase a number, they can decrease a number, they fluctuate, all that kind of stuff. Um, but what we haven't gotten into yet is how populations interact with each other, and that's really what community ecology is all about. And what's a community? It's a group of populations in a, of different species in an area, right? So if a population is a group of organisms of all the same species in an area, okay, a community is more than one population. Okay, so community ecology is examining how interactions between species and between populations affect community structure and organization. Okay, so here's an example of community. We clearly have a variety of populations of birds at this lake, so we can be studying this community and figure out how these birds interact with each other. Maybe they're, you know, working together to collect more fish. Maybe they have a negative impact on one another. Well, who knows? That's how we would, that's how we would, that's what we would study in community ecology. Okay, so one of the components of studying community ecology is studying the community structure. It's measured and described in terms of species composition and diversity. So how many species are there and how many members of each species are there in our community? So we can measure diversity of a community with what we call Simpson's Diversity Index. Now, there's other indices and different equations that you can use to measure the diversity of a community, but for the purposes of the AP Biology exam, we use Simpson's Diversity Index. Okay, and uh, th this is another one of the equations that you will get on the uh, equations and formulas sheet when you take the AP Biology exam. But here it is. Diversity equals 1 minus the sum of n over n squared. Um, the italics n, the lowercase n, represents the total number of organisms of a particular species. Um, but while the capital N represents the total number of organisms of all species in the community. And sigma represents the sum of all of them. All right, so how do you use this equation? Well, good thing that we're going to go through an example here. We're going to actually go through two examples of calculating Simpson's Diversity Index um, and how it measures maybe how diverse or how healthy a community might be. All right, so here we go. Um, here's, uh, oh, before we get into that, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, but something that we'll see from calculating Simpson's Diversity Index is that it really takes both species richness which is the number of different species in a community and its relative abundance into account, the proportion each species represents of all the individuals in the community. Both of these matter, and that's what we're going to see um, once we run through these examples. All right, so uh, here's example one. A community has three populations. Now, a real community is going to have way more than that, and this is going to be more difficult to calculate, but we're keeping it simple because we're learning, right? Uh, so a community has three populations. There's 15 individuals in population A, 25 in population B, and 5 in population C. Calculate the diversity index of this community. All right, there's our equation. How the heck do we actually use it? Uh, well, it's really plug and chug here, for, exa for example. Take a look. Uh, 1 minus the sum of n over n squared. Okay, we've got to take three different n over n's here because we have three different populations, and we add them all together. That's what that sigma means. Okay, so we go 1 minus, this is the number of population A, 15 divided by 45, because 45 is the total, 15 plus 25 plus 5 is 45, so 15 divided by 45 squared plus 25 divided by 45 squared, representing the 25 in population B, and 5 out of 45 squared, representing the 5 in population C. All right, so we add all these together and subtract 1 minus whatever the sum of this is, and then we'll get our diversity index. So if you plug this into your calculator, I invite you to do so and pause the video if you, uh, if you haven't done that yet. Okay. We get 1 minus, this ends up being 0 0.11 if we round up to the hundredth place, 0 0.31 and 0 0.01. If we, uh, if we put all these together, we'll end up with a diversity index, a, a Simpsons diversity index of 0 0.57, which isn't, what does that even mean? Uh, well, once we take a look at this other uh, community this, that might uh, might give you some insight here. All right, so let's run through another example, and I'll invite you to do this one by yourself if you feel confident doing that. Um, but yeah, we're going to use the same kind of formula here. Check it out. A community has four populations: 35 in population A, four in population B, 
five in population C, and six in population D. All right, so we have four different species now. Um, so what, let's calculate the diversity index of this community. If you want to rewind and go back, rewind. <laughs> if you want to go back a little bit to the previous example problems and maybe give you an indication of how to do this one, go ahead, pause it, try and figure it out for yourself. If not, I'm going to go ahead and click to the next. So if you'd like to pause, now would be the time. All right. Um, so if we work this out, check it out. We go 1 minus 35 divided by 50, because now our population is 50 um, squared, plus 4 divided by 50 squared, plus 5 divided by 50 squared, plus 6 divided by 50 squared, each representing the number of individuals in each population, 4, 5, 6, and 35. Uh, we end up getting 1 minus that, uh, 0 0.49 plus 0 0.006, 0 plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.014, and we end up with a Simpsons diversity index of 0 0.48. Even though we have higher species richness, meaning the, we have more species in this second community, check this out. We have a lower diversity index. Okay? Now, this is where that relative abundance comes into account. Check it out. We got 35 out of 50 organisms in this whole community all in the same species. Okay, so while we do have higher species richness, there's four species instead of three species, we have a lower diversity because there's much less relative abundance. Now, if we, uh, if we maybe spread this number out a little bit more and we had made even, say, uh, 12, 12, 12, and 12, then our species, then our, uh, species index might be higher. Okay? But that's how we use Simpson's diversity index. All right, the second part of this, uh, this topic in AP Biology is talking about Interactions between populations. This is the fun part, if you ask me. Um, communities change over time via interactions between populations. All right, so if you've got multiple populations living in an area, they are bound to interact with each other in one way or another. So interspecific interactions determine how populations access matter and energy, and they can be positive or negative for that population. They can harm it or benefit it. Um, so the species interactions that we're going to look at, and we're going to have a bunch of different examples, um, there, there's a kind of a significant... Uh, notation here that we can use to discuss the relationship or the interaction between these two populations. Plus plus, both species benefit, plus minus, one benefits, one is harmed, plus zero, um, one species benefits, the other has no effect, and minus minus means both species are harmed. All right, so you'll see this notation here for every example that we walk through. And I won't try to spend too long talking about these, even though we could talk about them all day. Um, so interspecific competition, this is the first interaction that we're going to talk about. It's negative-negative because it hurts both species. Um, when individuals of different species compete for a resource that limits the survival and reproduction of each species. So competition doesn't really help populations out. If they have to compete for space, they have to compete for resources, it doesn't help anybody, really. Um, so here's an example. It's, you know, not violent or anything, but weeds in a garden, right? The who's going to eventually uh, compete for better for more space and more resources and more access to sunlight, perhaps more water. Um, the weeds that grow really, really fast or maybe the plants that you want in your garden. Um, so that's a really good example of competition. And in fact, if you don't get the weeds out of your garden, if you don't want the plants that you don't want in your garden, um, it can lead to what we call competitive exclusion, which is the elimination of an inferior competitor. Okay, so maybe whatever you planted in your garden is not, um, doesn't grow as fast or it doesn't reproduce as fast as your weeds, um, and your weeds are maybe taking more resources from the soil, they're more efficient, then, you know, they can kind of eliminate the, the other plants in your garden, okay, which is not, not necessarily a good thing. Okay, so interspecific competition means that uh, the plants that supposed to be, are, are supposed to be in your garden are robbing resources and uh, space from the weeds, and the weeds are doing the same thing to the other plants. Okay? Um, so that doesn't really help. But what that can occur as a result of interspecific competition is uh, niche partitioning. Um, and niche partitioning occurs when similar species differentiate resources that they use in their environment, and it enables a coexistence in a community. So very similar species to each other, like, say, the Watsonole and the Green Anole, uh, that have a very close common ancestor, they're probably going to have the same niche or the biological role. They're going to have the same resources, the same space, that kind of stuff, and that would cause some competition. Um, but they've evolved in such a way that uh, they have different niches now. They can use different resources. They can uh, they can occupy different parts of the tree, maybe the forest, etc. And they can coexist with each, with each other. And that's called niche partitioning. And that results from competition. Okay, so a positive-negative interaction. There's three examples of them. 
um, they all fall into the category of exploitation. Uh, one species feeds on another and one is harmed. Okay, so that's exploitation and we've got a few examples here of predation, which is our first one. One species, the predator kills and eats the other species, the prey. All right, so this is probably the most common one you'll see on a nature program, so on and so forth. Hey, okay, this osprey is, uh, is a predator, the fish is the prey, this spider is a predator, a fly is the prey. Obviously, one species being benefited, they get food, and, you know, the other one dies. So that's a positive-negative interaction, right? Um, so predation is a really big example of how species can interact with each other in the same environment. Herbivory is similar to predation, except we're talking about, well, herbivores, animals that don't eat animals, animals, animals that eat plants. So an organism, the herbivore, eats part of a plant or algae, and it harms it. Um, deer are actually kind of a big problem in my part of the world, in the Midwest. Uh, they, uh, they don't have natural predators anymore. The, the wolves and the other predators that used to be in this area a long time ago are gone, so deer kind of grow like crazy, and they destroy plant life as a result of it. Their herbivory kind of destroys their plants in the community. Um, so that's a problem. Hunting is, a, hunting is an important thing for my area of the world out here in the Midwest, in Illinois, and uh, yeah. Um, a manatee, same thing. It can uh, it can ravage different types of uh, different types of algae and plants. It, it eats a lot. It's a it's a sea cow. That's literally what it's called. Okay, so herbivory is another form of exploitation, and then the most gruesome, of course, is parasitism, uh, where one organism, the parasite, derives its nourishment from another organism, the host, which is harmed in the process. Now, there's lots of grisly, gross examples of parasitism. Um, so we'll just stick with one here for time's sake. Um, check it out. These are these are wasp larvae. Okay, so some different types of wasps. What they do, they don't kill the caterpillar. Or they find a caterpillar. They don't kill it. They lay their eggs in it, and then the eggs, the larvae that are laid from the eggs, feed on the ca caterpillar from the inside. So this caterpillar is still alive, um, but it's carrying all these larvae, and these larvae are going to be nourished by the ca caterpillar until it dies, and then they're going to emerge from their cocoons and you know, parasitize other caterpillars once they're adults. It's pretty gross, okay? But, uh, yeah, poor caterpillar, right? Um, but, yeah, so the wasp larvae are the parasites, and the caterpillar is the host, as we would call that. And that's clearly exploitation. One's being harmed, one's being benefited. Uh, like, the parasites get a nice, cozy home, and they get food and stuff, and the caterpillar, ugh, yeah. All right, uh, but when both parties win, when we have a win-win, positive-positive interaction, that's called mutualism. And that's an interspecific interaction that benefits both species, and it can result in enhanced movement of or access to matter and energy. All right, so uh, the most famous example of mutualism, thank you, Disney, is uh, the clownfish and the anemone, right? So the clownfish gets protection from the anemone. It gives it a nice little home, and the anemone gets to feed off of the waste and whatever else the clownfish brings um, to the anemone, right? So the anemone is just sessile. And it stays there all the time, and it hopes to gather particles from the water, but clownfish are going to kind of bring stuff over there. They're going to excrete some waste that the anemone is going to feed off of, and then, you know, the clownfish is protected because the anemone will sting anything that tries to get the clownfish. They have a nice place to hide. Okay? Uh, another example of mutualism is happening inside you right now. You have billions and billions and billions of bacteria that are living in your digestive system right now, and they help you digest your food. Okay? So you take a probiotic or something like that, you eat a bunch of yogurt, you're actually helping out the bacteria that live in your gut. And they're really, really important, and they help you digest a lot of different foods that you normally wouldn't be able to digest. Um, so you get a benefit from that bacteria living in your stomach, and the, the bacteria in your stomach get a benefit by getting the steady supply of food and the steady supply of nutrients and a nice place to live okay, right inside you. Um, so that's mutualism as well. Our bacteria are our friends in our stomach. They're, they're, they're our friends. They're our good guys. Okay? Um, the last interaction that we're going to talk about is called commensalism. Um, and that's an interaction that benefits one species and neither ha helps nor harms the other. Okay, so uh, we saw this example earlier, but it's a remora and a whale shark. So this is the, one of the largest fish in the world. Actually, it is the largest fish in the world. Um, and what happens is that it gets these tagalongs here, like a remora. It's called a sucker fish as well. Um, and it will just basically attach itself to a whale shark and feed off of whatever kind of microorganisms attach themselves to the whale shark. Um, the whale shark doesn't care. It's not affected. But the remora gets a ride and it doesn't have to expend a lot of energy, and it gets some free food. Same thing, same kind of thing with this cattle egret and the buffalo. Buffalo get all sorts of flies and parasites on them, and it's kind of gross. Um, 
but the buffalo doesn't really care that much. You know, flies or whatever, it's not going to help help it or hurt it very much. But the cattle egret is going to, you know, kind of sit on top of it and eat whatever parasites land on the buffalo. So the cattle, the cattle egret gets a plus, but the buffalo, just whatever. Okay, so that's commensalism, and that's the last of our interspecific react or interactions. Um, and that's a community ecology. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions, and we will see you next time.